Two friends, Alan Dale and Jerry Carew, who grew up just a few streets apart in St. John's East End, have been separated by Canada's geography for three decades. They came together virtually during the pandemic to chat about like-minded interests. Alan lives in PEI and Jerry in Newfoundland. Thriving in remoteness has been a common theme for both of them during the pandemic. Gale Force Winds, the podcast is the result. And welcome to Gale Force Winds. I'm Alan Dale, and with me as always is my good buddy Jerry Carew. How are you, Jerry? I am doing well as usual. I've got, uh, you know, a few things going on, but uh, ultimately uh, what I'm really enjoying, Alan, are the conversations, and we're going to get into it very shortly, but we have a very special guest here today, uh, someone I met, I think, John, in the early 90s. I was sitting next to this guy at the YMCA. My wife was the aerobics instructor, and I, I think it was a year. Didn't know who you were. We just talked about this, that, and the other thing. And then uh, I found out that, you know, you were John Steele, and you've got an entrepreneurial side to you. So I, uh, I've always enjoyed our chats, and I'm really looking forward to this. John, uh, uh, Jerry, absolutely. It's the conversations that are great. I'm enjoying that. It's a, it's a pleasure to be the conduit to introduce inspiring people to our audience, people that will uh, inspire others to do great things. And that's really what the podcast is all about. It's celebrating good news stories in and around Atlantic Canada, and there's lots of good news to tell. So on that note, John, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is John Steele, and I'm president of uh, Steele Hotels and the Briggs Production Company, which is our uh, music company that puts off the uh, Iceberg Alley Performance Tent. And uh, I've been in the uh, been in business for thirty odd years, and uh, I was in the radio business up till approximately two and a half, three years ago. Uh, and our family owned the Newfoundland Capital Corporation, and. We had 100 radio stations across Canada, and I worked at that with my father and my brother, Rob. And uh, we exited that, you know, about uh, three years ago, and I'm solely focused right now currently on on the hotel business and and the uh, Iceberg Alley Performance Tent. John, you grew up in St. John's? Is that where you grew up? No, I grew up in Gander. Uh, Our family, uh, I was born in the U.S. I was born in Bethesda, Maryland. My father was the attache to the embassy down there when he was in the military. He was in the uh, military, for, in the Navy for 25 years. So he was uh, an attache to the embassy and uh, I was conceived in Newfoundland and I was born in the US. And uh, we moved to Gander in 69 when they were setting up uh, some type of communication uh, monitoring system uh, during the Cold War to monitor the Russians and stuff. My father was in charge of that. He came up and he was the commander of the base in Gander. and. So I grew up in Gander, graduated in 82, and went to Memorial, and uh, floundered around there for five to seven years, which was fantastic. I always say I attended Memorial University, I never graduated, and I uh, had a great time, met a lot of great people, learned a lot of great life lessons that didn't seem so great at the time, and uh, then uh, through the jigs and the reels, I uh, went down a real dark hole of uh, drug and alcohol addiction and uh, in the late 80s I, in 89 uh, I decided it was a lifestyle change and I went for that and then uh, I got cleaned up in 89 and uh, I was basically unemployable so I went to work for uh, for my father in the, in the family business in the radio business didn't have a clue what we were doing nor did he in the radio business and we got into that and for the first few years, we lost an extraordinary amount of money. And then we eventually, over time, started to pick away at it and got better and better at it. And then my brother Rob came in to the business uh, as president in the late 90s. And that's when it really took off on the tra- trajectory. Everything really came together for us. And then we exited uh, three years ago. You, uh, I served in the Navy for 30 years, and you couldn't have served in the Canadian Navy without hearing your dad's name. Uh, he's a bit, a bit of a legend within the naval circles. Uh, and it was a great, great evening. And this is another great evening. And it's great only because we reconnect with all of you. You can see by the array of speakers we've had, we're very different and diverse backgrounds, but all very great friends. And uh, 
that's the big thing I find, and as I get older, I find it more and more. It's so nice to have friends you can really count on. And both Catherine and I have certainly got a lot of friends, and I've been the type that uh, I think if anything I could do is, I think more than anything else, I've been a good connector. I've been able to get some great talent, talent that I didn't realize. Um, tell me about what, tell me, do you remember your dad's service in the Navy? Oh, very much so. Yeah, I do. Um, you know, and, and that, uh, like, I didn't really put two and two together uh, once he retired, why well, he never talked about it. I didn't think he really liked it. And he was so consumed with business and stuff. And he never talked about his Navy experiences, but it only really dawned on me a couple of years ago that, you know, he had the official Secrets Act. He couldn't talk about uh, what he was doing there. So that was a bit of a revelation. And, um, but yeah, I do remember dad serving in, in the Navy and it was, it was a different thing. I remember one time I was 14 or 15 years old and uh, I was sitting eating supper. I remember dad looked at me and he said, if there's anyone that's not cut out for the military, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your response to that, John? I really can't remember my response, but I remember him saying that to me, but I've never had any interest in being in the military, so it didn't really resonate with me on that front. I don't know I probably, if I should make... I probably, probably no? secretly agreed with him, really, you know. I, I don't know if I should make this comparison, but I was reading a bit about Jim Morrison and uh, his dad, I believe, was a major or something in the, oh, in the military. Admiral. And, uh, he was an admiral. admiral. Was yeah. he an admiral? Okay. Was, yeah. 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 So anyway, yeah, I could see you, when you said that, I kind of see Jim Morrison sitting with his dad, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, but, uh, but that being said, I mean, we didn't have an adversarial relationship at all. You know, I have a very excellent relationship with my parents and and that, but you know, very, very different times that they grew up in and obviously what I was growing up in and situations yeah. were different and stuff. And, you know, so, I mean, I think I'm a, a combination of, of both of my parents. You know, I mean, the thing is with my parents is that, you know, when my, my dad is the guy who got all the ink over the years and the accolades and all that, but the reality is my mother was a massive role in his success yeah. and in the business success. And she was, she's never really been given her due and uh, that, and uh, because uh, my mother was, especially on the hospitality side of things, she was very, um, very involved in the operational side of things and was very, very good at it and uh, very good at connecting with people. And, um, and then, you know, in terms of dealing with my father, you know, he came out of the Navy and, uh, and as we know, it's uh, very uh, much an orders go up, they come down type of environment. And uh, so I think that can really develop healthy ego or unhealthy ego, I should say, uh, of not being challenged. And I think my mother, once my dad got into the, into the businesses and things started moving along well with them, I think she was a very good grounding force for him uh, to keep it in perspective and uh, you know, keep, keep, the, keep it on the rails. John, a hundred percent. It's uh, it's amazing how many people we talk to, and they talk about their partner being found a foundation to keep them grounded, and uh, it's and I think that that's really uh, uh, to be celebrated as well. Jerry and I have that as well, where you know our partners are supportive of what we do. As crazy as the ideas might seem, sometime uh, you've got support at home at the dinner table, and and indeed. Uh, occasional critiques to say, hey, maybe you should do things a little different. And that's all a very uh, healthy part of it. Uh, but so, so at, at a certain point, your house must have turned very entrepreneurial. <laughs> very much so. It really yeah. did. And, uh, and that was when we moved to Gander. Uh, my, my parents were, uh, my mother was looking at uh, actually buying uh, some houses and real estate, and doing them up and flip them type thing. And so I think she had identified her property. This is 1969. And uh, her and my father went to the bank and uh, they wanted to get a mortgage on this house alone. And the bank guy said, look, why don't, uh, why don't you look at this, this uh, property, the Albatross Hotel is bankrupt. And uh, that's probably a better opportunity for you. So the two of them went down and, um, you know, they, risked everything and they, they bought it. And that was really the, the genesis for that we've all been able to build on over the years. 
John, uh, I got to say, I got to jump in there. I mean, that that's not a small feat where your mom and dad are not business people at this point. You're looking at flipping a house to go from flipping a house to taking on the albatross, which was bankrupt. I mean, there's so much. I mean, the karma around that must have been a little bit nerve wracking, but they didn't give a shit, I guess, and just push through. Right. Yeah, I think my mother gave a shit, I think, but I, you know, I don't think my dad did really. I don't know. I, I mean, I was so young and then yeah. so I can't really speak to that part of it, but you know, it was one of those things that we, you know, growing up, I was always fully aware that the chips were all on the table and we were all in, you know, I do, you know, and something for me in terms of exiting the radio business a few years ago, for me, it was a very emotional and philosophical reckoning for me to come with because in terms of uh, the philosophical, it was it was the first time in my life that I really look at it and go that all the chips weren't on the table, that we had actually monetized something, right? Yeah. Because every time we got something, we plowed it all back in again, you know? So that was sort of a different thing to get your head around. And uh, I'm yeah. amazed that your your mom and dad, so there they are in, in 69, you say, how old were the kids at that point? Well, I would have been four and Rob would have been eight. My oldest brother, Pete, would have been 12. That's a, oh. heck, of a, ti- that's a heck of a time to take some <laughs> risk, eh? Yeah, but yeah. you know. <laughs> These hungry mouths are sitting at the table. Feed me, <laughs> feed me. Yeah, but you know, I, I think, you know, dad was, you know, getting into his 40s there. And uh, I think he I think he looked at it, it was time to make the move. And I heard him say he was in the military at the, at the Gander. And he only had a half day's work maximum. So he had lots of time to, to do stuff. So yeah, right. I, I don't know. I mean, that's what he said. I just take it that it's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's well, I have a feeling, uh, no, I've met your father many times. His half day work is probably a lot more than most people's full day. Yeah, he's a pretty intense guy. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> yeah. So you uh, you you go down a dark hole there for a bit, and you return back into the family business. And where do you pick up the pieces there? When what, what do you dig into initially? Like what? Well, I, got into, I, I got into the radio business. And I had no idea really at all. I never listened to radio growing up. You know, I mean, it didn't really have uh, any big appeal to me, but I really, honestly, at that point, I didn't see any other options and, and yeah. stuff. So I, you know, I went and did it and I just worked through the different elements uh, of the business and try to learn it and get a grasp at it. And some elements I was pretty good at and others I was a disaster at, but, you know, I mean, you know, you go into that and, and, you know, you got this pressure of, um, you know, you're probably not bringing a whole lot to the table. And, you know, some people are resentful of that because of the nepotism and all that type of stuff. But then there's other people that were very, very good and, uh, and that you develop a really good relationship with and, and you learned a lot from, them, you know. And um, I think for me, a big thing that I learned out of that was that, uh, you know, people that are smarter than me, and most people are, that doesn't intimidate me. People that um, have a are more talented and a better skill set than me. That doesn't intimidate me at all. Um, I, I relish that, and I've always, in my career since then, it has. I've always taken the approach that if I could get those people to, to buy in to come in on my team and can match my intensity that I bring, we'll be okay. So uh, you know, my thing is I always look for people that are talented and smarter, and it's not hard to find people that are smarter than me. And more talented, but I, you know, I, I, I get them on the team. I get them to buy in. It's a lot to be said for that. A eh? surrounding yourself with really uh, good people that complement one another. But the, the other, the other half of that, John, is, and I think where some people fail on this is they don't listen to those people when they surround themselves with them. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. I mean that, that's part of it. You have them around, but you yeah. got to have people. You got to have create an environment where yeah. people feel that they can articulate to you what you know what they what they want and they feel comfortable doing that and uh, so the environment i try to have is that you know you feel free say whatever you want we'll take it out and then we'll we'll figure out where we're going but once we make the decision you got to follow the decision right you know yeah uh, but you know you got to hash it out you got you have to 
a hundred percent. And that's another good point too, John. That's so important that, you know, everybody laid out on the table, but once we decide a direction, that's the way we're going. Let's, let's yeah. stop. You know what I mean? And that too is lost sometimes along the way, right? You get a lot of back channel conversations happening. That wasn't the right way to go. And it, it kind of slows the whole progress down, but that, that's a fascinating approach for sure. Um, tell me a little bit. And the mom was a music teacher and yeah. there was mu music in the house. You were inspired by music. You you love music now. Tell me about that part of your life. Yeah, well, one of my earliest music, you know, things is I remember my 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 oldest brother Pete um, taking my grandmother Steele into the living room in the house in Gander and playing her a Bob Dylan song, and, <laughs> and I, I I don't think she knew what to make of it, and you know I don't think it really moved her a whole lot, but I do have that memory of it, and. Uh, uh, it's just something that's always been around. I think the arts is an incredibly important thing to have. And I think business and art are very similar in a lot of ways. There's a creative side to both of them. Yeah. I think both entities at times don't realize uh, that there is a natural connect uh, to the two. I think you have to be creative, obviously, to be a great artist. But I think to really propel a business ahead, um that uh, you have to be creative too creative ways to find how to make things work and a creative exchange of ideas and and you have to be able to communicate and things like that so there is a there is a, a, a connection i think more than a lot of people realize john i couldn't agree with you more uh i couldn't agree with you more the collision of the arts and business and is is vital and and you're right there's so many aspects that are similar between both groups we often think that they're very very different but they're so much more alike than they are different but what i find fascinating is there is so much creativity uh both in business and in the arts and culture community within atlantic canada what do you attribute that to well, that's a good question. You know, I, I can really only speak to Newfoundland on that, you know, because that's the, I mean, I've lived in Nova Scotia for a while, but, you know, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland is my home. It's a place where I have a sense of place. So in terms of Newfoundland, I think it's the isolation over the years that have um, been able to develop something that uh, I think we punch way above our weight when it comes to musicians poets, playwrights, painters, everything. I think it's the isolation and the having to entertain yourself, having to communicate, having to record history. And I think that's something that has brought us to where we, where we are today, you know? Um, that's, that's my take on it. And, and that's, a great, that's a great way to articulate it. I often describe Newfoundland as a being like a ship at sea. You have to rely on yourself. You have to rely on the team on board, the crew on board the ship, to solve all the problems. It, it really brings out creativity. It brings out innovation. It brings out resiliency. And I find that the Newfoundlanders are so resilient. Yeah, I think, it's, I think I would describe it that we're a ship at sea in really rough waters most of the time. It's very, right. you know, not very many calm waters. In <laughs> no. but, but, you know, on that note, John, you know, <clears throat> you, you and your family have obviously forged ahead especially in, in COVID times. And I think that's one of the reasons why I was really intrigued to talk to you. Uh, recently, you've, you've announced that you're going to continue with the expansion. And that, that has a whole arts side to it, what, what you're talking about. But I guess I just want to ask the question, in the middle of COVID, you're in the hotel industry and, and you're forging ahead with this project. Um, just talk a little bit about that and why others out there should forge ahead. I mean, I know COVID is a blip, but how do you, how do you get the guts to keep forging ahead? Well, you know, if you don't forge ahead, you're not living. You know, you have to forge ahead and all things pass. And, you know, we're, we're weathering the storm pretty good relative terms, our business for what we're in. And we're in a position where we can forge ahead. Um, so, you know, our view on it is that it's gonna take us about three years to build the expansion. And we think there's a lot of pent up demand. We think people will, will be moving again once they feel safe. You know, this is not the first pandemic in, in history. No. And, I think you know, 
uh, things change, but human nature doesn't change. And, you know, for example, you know, we're doing Zoom here, you know, and it, it's all right. It's one way to communicate, but it'd be much better if we were in the room and we could pick up on the energy of each other yeah. and actually make eye contact and I can see yeah. you tapping your foot or, or yeah. whatever, you know, there's, there's, there's different ways to communicate. So, you know, people want to connect and uh, traveling is a way of connecting. And that's not going to away. And uh, so we think there'll be a lot of pent up demand. And we're arrogant enough to think that we'll build a product that will be able to compete with the other products that are out there. And uh, so that's why we're moving ahead. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I, I think you might have told me about your vision for this hotel. You're, I think you're in the JAG right now, are you? Yeah, I am, yeah. I believe... I don't know when it came into your head, but it was decades ago you told me about this and you told me the land you had and all that. When it actually, like, it's it's amazing. So many people tell you things about, oh, I'm thinking about this and thinking about that. But you put in place the plan, the idea was in your head and you got it built. And there's something really special about that place. I've been in all your hotels. Um, you're doing a great job in, in Gander. But there's something special about what you got put together there. Uh, I, and, uh, I don't know if it's the music uh, theme. Um, I mean, maybe you can articulate what it is, but just, it just feels comfy. It's, there's something about it. Well, you know, I think there's, uh, look, there's, there's different type of travelers in the world, you know, and um, I just went at it. It's not rocket science. It's, you know, I went at it. I wanted a place that I would like to stay at. And, you know, uh, when I travel, I don't like being in the same type of place all the time. I like staying in a different place with a different vibe and, and that where other people, you know, they want to stay in a chain so that, you know, if they're in Dallas, it's the same where they were in Montreal. And right. there's nothing wrong with that. They want that consistency. And I totally understand that. But that's not what I like. I like when I go to a place, you know, or I want to know, you know, the place I stayed in St. John's was a cool spot. The place I stayed in Prague is a cool spot, you know, and so that's that's how I went at it, and I like music a lot, and I thought that it was a way to make it uh, something. I remember, you know, the, the thing that really solidified it for me was um, I was traveling with my brother, and we went to New York, and we stayed at a place down there, and they were playing some really good music, in it. and I said, you know, that's what it is. That's it's not rocket science, so let's move forward. But John, you say you say it's not rocket science, but I mean, you're starting a hotel and, it, and I mean, there's big chains out there to compete with. This is a gutsy maneuver to set up a boutique, beautiful hotel. And I get you. I was one of those guys who made that transition from I need the same thing over and over and over again, no matter where I am in the world. And then one day I was in the shower and I said, man, I'm tired of the smell of this soap. It's, it's the same all over the world. And I made the transition about five years ago. I'm only going to boutique hotels because it's as much of the experience as the entire trip. It's, I love the boutique feel now. I love that. You, you say that it's not uh, rocket science, but it, it's gutsy, man. That is a gutsy thing to get into that world. It might be gutsy, I suppose. I don't view it that way, but, uh, you know, um, it might be gutsy, but it's still not rocket science. Okay. You know, I mean, it's not. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I mean, I, there's a lot more complicated businesses yeah. than this. And, you know, make no mistake, the people that work in my businesses, they work very hard and they're very talented. So I'm not trying to yeah. uh, demean or diminish their work ethic or their contribution. No. But they're first class, you know. So I, I don't want to come across like that. But yeah. uh, it's not, uh, you know, I'm not an Einstein. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, well, John, I'll say this. I mean, I, I in a career, you know, I used to be in the advertising business, as you know, I traveled the island. I can tell you that despite the fact that I actually work for a competing organization to you and the radio stations, I loved staying in any of your properties. Your <laughs> staff were happy. Uh, and, and I tell you, you know, when you come off the road, I remember one, one trip in particular, I did 2,200 kilometers in four days. I was at the Glen Mill Inn, lying, lying in the bed, 
but I had such a great experience with the staff in your hotel there because I was friggin' tired. It was, I didn't have enough energy to go downstairs and eat that particular night, but I felt like I was home and that made it good for me, uh, you know, and I can tell you that, uh, you know, in talking to the staff, they all complimented you and your leadership, frankly. So from that perspective, um, I think, you know, you've, you've done a great thing to motivate the staff and get them moving in, in that direction. Um, but I, I did, back to the JAG, you know, a couple of the things that you got around there, uh, like that cassette table and stuff like that. Like, where, where does stuff like that come from? Like, did you get someone to make that, that or did you find it? Like, are you going around and finding these in, you know, um, you know little shows or something? Like, what, where do you find the table? Top of my head is probably the thing. <laughs> I did, how did I come across it? I think someone sent me a picture of it and said, this is cool. I think that, that's how I have it. And if, if, if that's what happened, I, I should remember who did it, but I can't remember who sent it to me. But then I ordered it. So, but I mean, it's a great conversation piece, right? It's uh, a lot of people yeah. talk about that and stuff, you know? I mean, different things resonate with people, you know? Like, uh, you know? Yes. Yeah. So a bit, I mean, a big part of a boutique hotel, of course, is the restaurant, right? And the food and all that kind of stuff. How do you, how do you narrow down your culinary team? Where do you find those, that team? Well, you know, that's a good question. You know, you just go out and, and you just, you just source them out and, and you go for it. And then, you know, I mean, I can't cook, but uh, I mean, uh, uh, like I, I say to people, I don't know cooking, but I know eating. Right. And uh, I mean, you know, so just get at it and we just, all hands are in it. You know, we all, you know, should do this and should do that. And some of it works and some of it doesn't, but you know, it's, uh, you know, my, my mother was always big on having quality food in, in, in restaurants in, in hotels and because, you know, in a lot, not all, it's, it has changed, but I mean, there's always that um, assumption uh, that, you know, you go to the, to the restaurant and the hotel you're staying at because you don't, it's convenient or you don't have enough time before you get to your meeting. So we'll just go there rather than go somewhere else. And we've always tried to make it a, a destination. And, and uh, you know, we, uh, in our properties, we do very well with, with the locals. We have a lot of people coming into our restaurant that aren't staying in the hotel, but live here. So I think that's a testament that the, that the, uh, the uh, kitchen and the restaurant staff are, are delivering a good product. Well, it's funny you say that uh, when I traveled to Gander, I always stayed at Sinbad's and it was because it was the best, it's probably the best steak in Newfoundland Labrador. And the well, last time after- I saw you was in the Jag dining room. Sir. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, no, no, we like that. Um, John, I want to, I want to pivot a little bit because uh, the other thing that you're doing that is very interesting is the Iceberg Alley performance tent. Back to music, Alan. You know, um, I've been there many, many times. Uh, I look forward to it starting again. If you don't mind, just share, like, how, how did this thing evolve? Uh, we were there prior to it actually being a tent. Uh, I think there's a pretty interesting story about where the tent came. But if you could just talk a little bit about the impetus for that. And, and it's, it's a wonderful, wonderfully run experience and i will tell you this and i think i told you one of the best concerts i've ever been to in my life was burton cummings my wife and i and friends were right up front i think burton was sweating on us and it was he just he even said he loved the facility he just found it so i don't know he he, he couldn't put his finger on it he kept talking about it all night but anyway just if you don't mind talking a little bit about that yeah, well, you know, as we talked about earlier, you know, I'm a big music fan. I've been to a lot of festivals and, and stuff and uh, a lot of concerts over the years. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think it's a, you know, one of the great gatherings of humanity is when you can come together in a concert and connect. You, you know, there, there's something about recorded music that, that provides something, but when there's something that is live, and when I mean live, I don't mean only that you're there in the facility. I mean that the people that are actually on the stage are actually playing their instruments uh, as opposed to it being tracked or recorded. And, and, and that I, I believe that that exchange of energy is one of the greatest things that happens for humanity. But, um, you know, I always wanted as a kid, I couldn't play an instrument. I didn't have the patience or the focus to play instruments. And, and stuff. So I, you know, I used to go to festivals and I always said, geez, I'd love to do a festival. 
you know, and, and, and stuff. And, and I'm a real music snob. So I looked at it and I went, uh, you know, you got to look where you live. You know what I mean? If you're going to do 10 days in Newfoundland, you're betting against the weather. I mean, that, that, I mean, your odds are just, just not that. So anyways, um, you know, a few years ago, I was in London and uh, I went and saw Patti Smith in Hyde Park and I went up and she was playing in a tent. And I thought, you know, geez, this is the way to do it back home. Get a tent and then uh, do that. So I came back and um, there's a guy who works for me, uh, uh, Sean Basha, who's a, who's a sort of a Renaissance man. He's a, he's a guy, he has a, a incredible uh, a range of talents and he can get stuff done. And um, he's a musician, he's a technical guy, he's got all that. I gave him my idea and then he really made it happen. And, and uh, you know, so I gotta give credit to Sean on that, but he, he delivers the goods and uh, he's a very hardworking guy. And, and so he took my idea and he took it to another level. But once again, you know, we went at it, the same approach that we went over to a hotel. Like, what, used to piss me off when I go to shows is that, you know, you got to line up for a can, you know, right? Or yep. if you're going to go get a drink, which I don't drink anymore, but, you know, you're gone, you miss all the yep. the show because it's not efficient. So we, we said, how are we going to do this so that it's always moving? You can get a beer when you want very quickly, or, you know, you can go and have a leak and then come back and, you know, you, yeah. and so we really went at it, like, how can we be really efficient on that i think that's what we did and we did certain things like you know we said why don't you uh, you know it's 10 days so you know if you buy tickets they're good for all 10 nights you don't have to keep going back every night and buying tickets you know yeah. your your drink tickets and stuff like that so that's that's how it came into being really it just started rolling i mean it's not a from an economic model it's a top top business right yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, and the music business, I mean, I would say to you, if you're a music fan, don't get in the music business because you can get very, very cynical and tarnished. It's just the slimiest business you'll ever come across. Um, you know, uh, and I've been around a lot of businesses and, uh, but, you know, that being said, uh, you know, we do enjoy it. And so, you know, the other thing is I looked at it is that, uh, so we had the idea and Sean ran with it and he delivered that, but. The other factor that comes into it is that, you know, we're on a rock in the middle of North Atlantic and you, we got to create things here to make things happen in a place where people want to live. And, you know, if you want to attract businesses and grow things, you know, people got to have events to go to. They got to have great restaurants. They got all those things, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, that's a big part, I think, of us moving forward. It, it all comes together is that, uh, you know, you got to have a quality of life and, and not to, you know, sound too dramatic, but that's just one event I think that adds to, to, to the city. I think, uh, you know, and, and we're getting the steam. It takes a while to build these things up, you know, and, right. uh, you know, we had a few snags in the road, like the first year we we're going to do it and we were moving along on it. And Sean came to me and said, John, I don't think I can deliver to you what, I said, I can make it happen, but it's not going to be the event that we want it to be. And you only have, you know, one chance to make a first impression. So how long, how long ago was that, John? That, that would have been the beginning. Yeah, that was the first, that was the first year that, that did not go. Right. So we pulled the plug. We didn't do it. And oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah we wow. took a hit on it and stuff, and, and, but we didn't want to do it because it wasn't right. So, so you had bands booked and, oh, yeah. and, and yeah. you pulled the plug. Yeah. So you had to pay them. Yeah, we, you know, we, we paid them in full. We didn't have to pay them in full, but we did pay them in full, though we got no benefit from it in the end. I always, so, so then we, they, then we, the really focused on it, and and then the next year it went, and uh, and Sean and everybody, you know, there's, there's other people besides Sean that are involved in it that did a great job putting it together, and. Uh, and then we had to cancel in the pandemic year, obviously. Yeah. So, John, just back it up a little bit. So you're you're sitting there. You've got the first year planned. So just so I understand this, there's there's holes in it. Did you have a ten 
night was it a 10 day thing the very first year yeah it was, and, and so yeah. you you had holes in 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 the schedule did you is that what happened and it just wouldn't have been no what you were no, envisioning? We didn't have holes in the schedule what we had was we had holes in terms of you know uh of putting the actual event together to create an experience that we thought would be really first class you know and um and uh, we we weren't comfortable that we could really deliver the product that we would be able to hold our heads up high about so we we were, we were blessed that we were able to had the power to walk away from it for a year so how close were you to the first performance when you pulled the plug on that were you like six months away a year I'd two weeks we probably, no 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 i'd say we we're probably three months out three to four months wow this and is a story i did not know uh, <laughs> it's interesting and that's why we like doing this you know al we get to talk to people like john and 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 really delve into how these things evolve. Uh, you know, anyone sitting back that went to it two years ago, I guess two years ago now, uh, you, you know, you look around, it's very efficient. You're right on the, the you know, go get a beer, shoom, in, go to use the bathroom, in, out. So you don't realize, you know, uh, how, how you yeah. did it. And it's funny, I was reading a story about uh, Steve Jobs uh, and, and he, he actually had an Apple store ready to go. He went in, didn't like something. And he literally said, nope, we're not opening this. And I think he delayed it by six months. It's curious to me that you're willing to pull the plug when you're that close to the event happening. But I guess you got to, don't you, to make the first impression? Yeah, you know, the way I viewed it was at that time was that, uh, you know, I take the hit now, but if I went ahead with it, I would have took a longer, right. more bigger hit over the course of time. So, you know, I mean, we, we won an award for like event of the year after our first year, you know, uh, from the city, they, they give us the tourism event of the year. So, uh, which is really Sean's award and um, and then some other people. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, if I had to do that again, I would absolutely make the same decision. You know, I have no doubts on that. John, I'm curious when I talk to guys that run hotels and run big entertainment events, there's got to be funny story or two in there you want to share with us. <laughs> oh, jeez, you know, uh, I've, uh, nothing really that comes comes to my mind right now that would be a really good one. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of you know, so many different aspects of things that go on. Yeah, well, Jen, I I was at the Jag the morning after a Lover Boy played, uh, and who's sitting there having breakfast but Mike Reno, and I'm like. <laughs> My wife says, look, 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 that's Mike Reno. And I mean, to be honest with you, I didn't know that much. I wasn't a big Loverboy fan. She was a Loverboy fan. Who goes up and says hello to him? Not her, but me. And I take my little fella, you met him, Sebastian. He goes over, shakes hands with him. And, and he, he, Mike Reno said something like, you know, this was a lot of fun. And he made a comment on the Jag. He just felt comfortable there. So I think, you know, the other thing that I think you're doing is bringing Newfoundland onto the map. I mean, I don't know what kind of conversations you're having with a lot of these, these stars and stuff, but um, hopefully this becomes a destination because as you said, we're a ship in a very rough sea. What the heck does Mike Reno care about St. John's Newfoundland? Like, that's another question. How do you even convince, you know, Burton Cummings? What, what does Burton Cummings want to do coming here? Like, why? Why? Jerry, forget, yeah, you got to take the fan part away from it. It's about money. It's business, yeah. right? They'll go anywhere where the money is, right? right. Uh, so that's what it comes down to. But I do have a story about Burton Cummings. Is that I was standing next to him, and uh, he was, you know, the, he was the last one to go on. So all the rest of the band are out playing, and he looked at me and he said, you know, he said, "I'm so nervous." And I said, well, "That's why you're great." <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, but I mean, these musicians travel everywhere; they can all over the world, of course. Do they find a special connection in Newfoundland? Do they enjoy the people in Newfoundland? I think some do and some don't. You yeah. know, I, you know, I mean, they're because they're only they're they're people too. So right, like, yeah. some people will go, yeah, this is great, and then, you know, I mean, God knows what's going on in their life at the time. You know, I mean, you could, yeah. I mean, a guy comes, he's in a great part of his career and he's doing yeah. great, and you know, he's enjoying it, or you know, they, they could come and they could be in a party. You know, they don't they don't own the rights to the songs anymore. And, yeah, you know they're playing for such a smaller crowd, and you know yeah. their wife just left them, and their kids yeah. in rehab, and they're like, "Geez, I'm playing for X <laughs> amount of bucks tonight," and they're not in a good mood about it. You know, I've seen all that too, so you know, I mean, yeah. it, 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 you know, and and 
one thing I found you know, as a as a music fan and music snob that I am, you know, obviously when you're doing 10 nights in a row or you know, there are other concerts that you've done, you don't always, you know, book artists that necessarily appeal to you. Not too right. not talented, but just not everything resonates with you. And it's always funny that, you know, when you book, you know, somebody who's who you really, really enjoy their work. And you, as a person, you don't really connect with them a whole lot. And yeah. then you book another person whose work you don't connect with at all, but they're like really, really good yeah. person and <laughs> you act about everything. Yeah. You know, that's always pretty. John, uh, uh, I, I love Yeah. I, I got it. You're, you're, you're making me think of something here now. Uh, you know, given that you've had so many of these acts here, a couple of questions. First one is, have you been on the cusp of anyone that you are like, oh my God, we're going to get this person. And then it didn't happen. And are there any that you would like to have that are on your agenda for the future that would be an absolute dream band playing in that tent? Um, I don't know. If you asked me 10 years ago, I'd probably have a different answer for you than it now. Uh, now Are you that, telling me you've matured? Is that what's going on? What's going on? Yeah, I don't view <laughs> it in the same light as much anymore. I really, truly really don't. So you know? You're not starstruck by any of this, by the sound of it, right? Not particularly, no. no. Not anymore. Yeah. I, I would before, but no, not really now. But, you know, I'm not really starstruck guy, I suppose. I don't yeah. yeah. Well, listen, if you need a good PEI band, I know the drummer of Midlife Crisis. <laughs> I mean, this band is unbelievable. They're on fire. I've heard uh, of them. Yeah. I heard, I heard they're wild. You know, they're great. <laughs> John, that's a fascinating conversation. A backstage pass, really, to that, uh, that whole business. I'm impressed uh, as you speak, uh, whether it was about the hotels or whether it's about um, uh, with the event in St. John's, the music events. Uh, you pass the credit on to the staff. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a very, uh, it's a very true leadership quality. You must have a great team around you. That uh, it's, it's, it's all about the people. You know, Joe Strummer of the Clash is one of my uh, idols, and uh, and I did meet him, and he was he was pretty cool. But uh, you know, as he said, without people, you're nothing. And you know, that's a he's so right, and that's something that I was able to get from my parents. My parents were very big on that, particularly my mother. Um, who, uh, you know, you have to engage people, not only your customers, but your team, you know, and you have to be in tune with them and you have to be authentic with them and you have to do your best with them. And, and sometimes you come up short and when you come up short, you have to admit it. And there's times that they think you come up short, but in your mind, you don't think you came up short and you might, right. you know, part ways or whatever, but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's the thing you gotta, you gotta hold yourself accountable and you have to hold them accountable. And, uh, you know, I think people want to be heard and, and, uh, and treat people as best you can, as fairly as you can. And, uh, I, overall, you know, you can move it forward with that, but if you, if you can't get people with you, I mean, you're just, I mean, it's forget it. It's, you're not, you're not taking it anywhere, you know, and, um, so, you know, the thing is, is that I, I try to do a lot of reading there, you know, on, on that type of stuff, you know, philosophical stuff and spiritual stuff, and management stuff, and just history and that, that type of stuff, because, you know, that's, that's what I can bring to the equation. Like, you know, I mean, I, uh, you know, my, I don't you know, I don't have any technical skills in my businesses, you know, I can't cook and I can't do sound or but i'll find people that can do it and do it well and yeah and, uh, be able to, hopefully be able to engage them in the process so that they're very proud about it and it's a good game for them yeah, john so you, uh, sorry we're, we're coming to the end here now uh, i do have uh, one question that uh, i think you and i've talked about this in the past you know it's one thing to have a hotel it's another thing to have a second hotel it's a whole other ball of wax to have six, seven, eight, whatever hotels, a hundred radio stations. What is it about an entrepreneur that will cause them to create something like, you know, 
your dad created, Rob created, you are creating. You know, you're not, and I don't, it's not about satisfaction, I guess, but what is it that makes you want to have, you got a hotel here, you got a hotel there, now you're expanding. Like what? And I know we talked about forging ahead, but it's it's curious to me about someone, like to, to create one business is an enormous amount of effort, you know, um, to do what you guys have done is just astounding. And we need more of this. But anyway, if you just, what's, what's your thinking on that? Well, I think, you know, I mean, I can obviously only speak from my experience and it's, you know, when you're second generation, it's a different reality than the first generation. I mean, the first generation, they are a super unique bunch. People that can take something of no movement and create this momentum. I mean, that's a different skill set of uh, being able to take what's handed off to you and grow that, you know? So one word I think that is overused is entrepreneurs. You know, I mean, I think just because you have a business doesn't mean you're an entrepreneur. And I honestly, and I'm not in the false humility or anything like that, I don't believe in that, but I don't really view myself as an entrepreneur. I, I, I've grown up to first, uh, first ring, uh, you know, or ringside seat to entrepreneurship. And uh, they're, they're a different breed. And just because you have a business doesn't make you an entrepreneur. I think it's yeah. a mindset. It's, a, it's an ability to, uh, it's, a, it's a bravery and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the ability to weather the knocks. Uh, you know, there's many, many different factors into it. But so I know I sort of lost my thought on it. But uh, yeah, it's, you know, I mean, yeah, it, it's, you know, not everybody's an entrepreneur who has a business. I'll say that. No. And I think, you know, uh, knowing your father and talking to him, I, knowing of him, I mean, it's, it's, it's an all-consuming thing, isn't it? I remember your brother told a story, I believe it was at your dad's 70th birthday, which I was attending. Um, uh, and he told a story, I think it was in Florida, and he, he called Rob and said, yeah. Now, Dad, on the other hand, we've all talked a fair bit about Dad tonight, and uh, I'm going to be brief on this one, but uh, many of you will relate to this. He is absolutely, he's a man of action, and uh, he doesn't like to keep still. He doesn't like things being static. And uh, he's always flying somewhere, or he's always driving somewhere, and you know, go back and forth to Florida. He just likes to be in motion, and uh, that's just part of his character. And I remember one day he was in Florida, and he called me up and said, uh, uh, "Rob, I'm coming home. I'm gonna. Can you pick me up at the airport at uh, at, at noon?" And uh, I said, "Sure, no problem." So I, I went into the airport. This was in Halifax. I picked him up, and uh, he said, "Let's go to the Inn on the Lake and have lunch." So the Inn on the Lake was only about 10 miles from the airport. We went to the Inn on the Lake and we had lunch. And uh, by my said, you're gonna have to take me back to the airport now. It's, uh, it's you know, my flight's at uh, 2.50. And I said, you kid, where are you going? He said, I'm going back to Florida. That's a true story. And you know, that's, that's a sort of illustrates the way he is. It's unbelievable. a really cool story and it's stuck with me about for uh, i don't know how your dad must be close to 90 now is he yeah it'll be 92 in june wow. wow yeah so anyway yeah that's that story stuck with me and that's that's uh, uh, john stories stick with us you know uh and the people that are going to watch this i think will be intrigued and uh hopefully motivated hey alan that's what we're after here 100% and already been motivational for me. I've quite enjoyed it. I What I find fascinating, John, is uh, as how you approach your lines of business. You say, I like that. I'm going to replicate that. I like doing this thing. I'm going to replicate that. That's you may not you may not consider yourself entrepreneur, but that, that thought process to me is pretty remarkable. I'm right? stealing stuff all the time, you know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, uh, John. You know, where do you see you taking? Uh, this side of the business now, kind of as we exit the as we exit the, the pandemic and life comes somewhat back to normal or a, a new normal. What do you what what does the future look like for you? Well, as we spoke, we're expanding Jag here now. We got plans. We got one design for Halifax that we were going to move ahead with at this time, but due to the to the the pandemic stuff, you know, we got that on hold. Uh, so we might move to the Halifax market. 
And then, you know, we'll look at where we, where we want to go. But the only thing for me is that, you know, it's got to be fun and viable. I mean, if it's just viable for me, I, I you know, I'm at the stage in my life that, uh, you know, uh, I'm, you know, uh, when I look at uh, my, my father or my brother, Rob, they're deal makers, right? And they're very, very good at it. And I'm more of an operational side type guy. That's what I enjoy. Uh, so if a business is viable, uh, it's, at this stage of, the, of, of my life, that's not, that's not appealing enough for me. Right. It's got to be fun. It's got to be intriguing for me to be in, at it. And um, so I'll see what, uh, what comes our way and, and what we want to create. And, 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 but it's got to be fun and viable, and we'll take it from there. So. That's a great approach. Uh, John, uh, we always ask our guests uh, to leave the audience, you know, with one small takeaway. And sometimes I call it a piece of advice. Sometimes I call it a life lesson, call it whatever you want, but it's one small takeaway from a guy that's had some great experiences, met some really cool people along the way, done some neat things. Um, what would that one small piece of advice be to the audience? I think you have to be incredibly honest with yourself on what you bring to the table and what you don't. That's good. Right. And, uh, I, you know, we often referred to that when I was in military service as understanding your capabilities and your limitations, yeah. understanding both, right? Yeah. And, and, and being honest with the people around you about both. Um, that's a fantastic takeaway. Uh, Jerry, what are your final thoughts on today's, it was a great interview. Well, like, you know, John, I've known you since the days of sitting on that bench at the Y. Uh, one thing that I, I can say, Alan, you know, I've been in sales for 30 years and it's, it's a long time. Um, you know, my dad died when I was very young. Um, I'm not going to get too philosophical here now, <clears throat> but it's sometimes in, in the sales business, you meet business people um, that have created something special. And I can tell you that can be pretty intimidating. One thing I found about you, John, is that, you know, you've never been that way. You've always been open. Uh, you're true to what you say. You've made me feel comfortable. And I always found that pretty interesting, given that I worked, frankly, for the competition. Uh, but, you know, for that, I just want to say, you know, thank you. Uh, you've uh, motivated me uh, for many years in just these brief encounters that we've had. And uh, I think this province is in good hands when we have people like yourself willing to come on and talk about themselves like this. So if there's someone listening to this that gets motivated by what you've said, Alan, you and I have done our job. And thank you to you, John. Well, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. And uh, best of luck with everything, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's another wonderful conversation on Gale Force Winds. And what an absolute pleasure it was to have John Steele on with us. Talk about his adventures. Here's a guy who points his finger and says, I want to do that. And he gets it done. And it's things that interest him. And I really enjoy the tail end of the conversation when we talk about it's got to be fun and viable because that's where John is in his life. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, another good episode, Gale Force Wins, and I always like to leave the audience with my own small takeaway, and that is, the world needs more John Steele. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Gale Force Wins. That's Gale Force Wins, W-I-N-S dot com.